Hey friends, it is great to be with you today. If you are joining us online for the first time ever, special welcome to you. My name is Jason Wolliver. I'm the directing pastor here at Crossroads, and it's great to have you joining us. This is week two in our summer message series, Exodus, Living into God's Freedom. Today we're in Exodus chapter 6, verses 1 through 13. Hear this reading from God's word. But the Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand he will send them out, and with a strong hand he will drive them out of his land. God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they lived as sojourners. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the people of Israel, whom the Egyptians told as slaves, and I have remembered my covenant. Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burden of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God, who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you for a possession I am the Lord. Moses spoke thus to the people of Israel, but they do not, did not listen to Moses because of their broken spirit and harsh slavery. So the Lord said to Moses, Go in, tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let the people of Israel go out of his land. But Moses said to the Lord, Behold, the people of Israel have not listened to me. How then shall Pharaoh listen to me? For I am of uncircumcised lips." But the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron and gave them a charge about the people of Israel and about Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to bring the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt. And this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit, fill now the hearts of your people as we draw near to you to hear from your word. I pray that you will speak words of comfort, challenge, freedom, and love. Open now your word to our hearts and our hearts to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So I will admit that it is easy for me to get distracted by clicking on articles on the internet which have no significant value. Things like, Top 10 U.S. cities to never visit in the month of June. Or Warren Buffett's top three pieces of advice for planning a great family vacation. I don't know who writes these articles, but there is a clear market to guys like me who are amused way too easily. This week, I came across an article entitled, The Top 20 Overused Lines in Cinema. And some wonderful author had taken the time to catalog 20 cliche lines from movies and then list every single movie that they'd ever been used in. And it was quite eye-opening. I really appreciated his effort. One of the lines was, I could tell you, but I'd have to kill you. Supposedly first used in the 1986 movie Top Gun, by Tom Cruise. And if you watch the scene from that movie where he says that to Kelly McGillis in the classroom setting and you hear their laughs, you think that must surely be the first time it was ever used because people don't laugh nearly as hard at that any longer. Another was the line, is that all you've got? Supposedly first used in the 1979 movie Rocky II. Another is the line, He's standing right behind me, isn't he? Supposedly first used in the 1991 movie City Slickers. Now it's on TV and in movies all the time. But the overused movie line, which is the most relevant to our scripture today, was first used in the 1964 James Bond movie Goldfinger. And it's the line, 
We can do this the easy way or the hard way. When God sent Moses to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to tell him to let the hundreds of thousands of Israelite slaves leave Egypt that they might go into the land of Canaan, it's as if God said to Pharaoh, Pharaoh, we can do this the easy way or the hard way. The easy way would have been for Pharaoh to say, oh, well, Moses and Aaron, you seem to be very sincere in your request and you ask nicely and I believe it's okay, I'll, I'll let them go with you and it was nice having them when they were here. That didn't happen. God sent Moses in and he had to ask Pharaoh over and over and over and over again, Pharaoh chose the hard way. Last week we left off with Moses and the Israelites completely discouraged. Moses and Aaron had gone to Pharaoh, asked nicely for him to release the Israelites. Pharaoh had flown off the handle, gotten extremely abusive toward the Israelites, making demands that were impossible for them to meet, and then punishing them for not meeting them. Then the Israelites got mad at Moses and Aaron for stirring up Pharaoh against him. And then the chapter ends with Moses getting angry at God for sending him in the first place. Chapter 5 closes with these verses. It says, Then Moses went back to the Lord and protested, Why have you brought all this trouble on your own people, Lord? Why did you send me? Ever since I came to Pharaoh as your spokesperson, he has been even more brutal to your people, and you have done nothing to rescue them. Chapter 6 is God's answer to Moses. He lays out in more detail what he plans to do, and then sends Moses back to Pharaoh. And it's a pretty powerful chapter. As I studied this chapter, there's so much in it. But I came across four big truths about God that we really need to always keep in mind, and then an application to go with each one of them. And I hope you find these encouraging today. The first big truth we see about God in this chapter is that God is completely sovereign. God is completely sovereign. I just love verse one. The Lord said to Moses, now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. I love it. It could be from a movie. Hey, I'm just getting started. Now you'll see what I'm going to do to this guy. He says, for with a strong hand, he will send them out. With a strong hand, he will drive them out. I love the juxtaposition of these two sentences. You will see what I will do to him, but then he, Pharaoh, will end up driving them out of the land. This is a perfect picture of how God's sovereign will works with human free will. God gave Pharaoh a choice about whether to cooperate or not. But when they ref refused over and over again to cooperate, God still got his will accomplished. He acted of his will to motivate Pharaoh to want to set the Israelites free, even though he wouldn't have done it had God not intervened so dramatically. God sent those 10 catastrophic plagues on Egypt as a result of Pharaoh's disobedience. After each one, Pharaoh had a choice again about whether to let them go. Each time, he chose wrong. In the final one, Pharaoh sends Israel away only to chase them again and see his soldiers drowned in the Red Sea. God got them out because no one can thwart God's sovereign will. The application for all of us is that we need to trust God's sovereignty. Several years ago, I read a really helpful book by a guy named Jerry Bridges called Trusting God Even When Life Hurts. And he said, when life hurts, we need to keep in mind these three principles. Number one, that God is completely sovereign. Number two, God is infinite in wisdom. And number three, God is perfect in love. I remember uh, several years ago, I was living in Mascuda. And there was this older gentleman who's kind of a mentor to many young people in the community. And one night I came across him and something alarming had happened in my life that day. And I shared it with him and he said, wow, 
It would be really easy to get discouraged if we didn't know who was on the throne, wouldn't it? And he was totally sincere. He was empathizing, but what a great way to look at it. It would be really easy to get discouraged if we didn't know who was on the throne. But we do know who is on the throne, and it is the Lord. And the Lord is the one who governs the universe and brings all things toward the accomplishment of his purposes. Without violating the free will of human beings, he always gets his job done. I love Ephesians chapter 1, verse 10, which says that God works all things according to the counsel of his will. So if things happen to be hard right now in your life, don't assume for a second that that means that you are outside of God's will for your life. What biblical example can you find where someone is doing God's will and that makes life get easier all of a sudden? We don't get the promise that things will be easier. What we get is the promise of Romans 8, 28, that God causes all things to work together for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purpose for them. I can tell you the most insecure way to live as a Christian is to try to follow God, but believe that any human being behaving poorly can derail God's purpose for your life. God is not that weak, my friends. No little human being on a power trip can keep you from fulfilling the purpose for which God created you. If you are feeling insecure that way, I would invite you to daily declare the words of David from Psalm 138, verse 8. He says, The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Say it with me now. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Trust God's sovereignty. The second big truth we learn about God is that God keeps all of his promises. Verse two, God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty, but by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they lived as sojourners. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the people of Israel, whom the Ephesians hold as slaves, and I have remembered my covenant. As I was studying this, what I loved about this is that God says that the deliverance that he's going to accomplish for the Israelites in the present day was in fulfillment of a promise that he made to their ancestors hundreds of years ago. God never forgets his promises. He always keeps his promises. Now, the covenant that he's referring to was first given to our father Abraham back before he even had Isaac, his firstborn son, through his wife, Sarah. He was still being called Abram at the time. In Genesis 15, it says this, Then the Lord took Abram outside and said to him, Look up into the sky and count the stars if you can. That's how many descendants you will have. Then the Lord said to Abram, you can be sure that your descendants will be strangers in a foreign land where they will be oppressed as slaves for 400 years. It's talking about what they were going through in Egypt. But I will punish the nation that enslaves them. And in the end, they will come away with great wealth. After four generations, your descendants will return here to this land for the sins of the Amorites who live here do not yet warrant their destruction. So the Lord made a covenant with Abram that day and said, I have given this land to your descendants all the way from the border of Egypt to the great Euphrates River, the land now occupied by the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Kadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. And yes, I did rehearse saying those names so that I could deliver them with great proficiency to you in this video. So we see several reasons why God will bring Israel out of slavery and into the land of Canaan to take possession of it. One is because God promised Abraham that he would give that land to Abraham's descendants as an everlasting possession, and the nation of Israel are the descendants 
of Abraham through Isaac and Jacob. Second, he would do it because the people of Israel had groaned and cried out to him. And God always hears the cries of his people and hears their prayers. Three, God would do it because the people living in the land of Canaan were desperately wicked and their sin had piled up before God's eyes and he was ready to put an end to the atrocious practices of the people that live there. In all of these reasons, we can see a theme that God acts according to his character at all times and God always keeps every promise he has made to his people. The application for us is that we need to live daily according to God's promises. As Christians, every day there's a battle going on for our thoughts and our minds. How are we going to live? Satan would have us base our actions and our decisions on current circumstances, our current mood, our current feelings on the messages we're receiving from the culture and the world, on the desire to have a life of ease, uh, free of discomfort. And so we can live that way. We can make decisions based on what's easy, based on circumstances. The other way to live is to live as if God will keep every single promise he has made and live that way. In fact, I believe there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to make our decisions daily, not on present circumstances, but on God's eternal promises. What promise of God do you need to start believing again today with all of your heart? Maybe you're feeling unfruitful in your Christian life right now. And you need to start believing again the promise that Jesus made in John 15, four and five, where he said, if you remain in me, I will remain in you. And if a person remains in me and I in them, they will bear much fruit. He said, because you did not choose me, but I chose you that you should go and bear fruit, fruit that you will last. Abide in Jesus day after day, he'll abide in you and you will bear fruit in his time, in his way for his glory. Maybe you're dealing with temptation right now and you're failing in that. You're giving in way too often. And you just need to start believing the promise of 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13, which says that no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond your strength. But with the temptation, he will provide the way out so that you may be able to endure it. You need to believe that and live as though it's true, even though the temptations keep coming. Maybe you're going through tight times financially right now, and you don't know if God's going to keep you afloat. And you need to go back to that promise that Jesus made very early on in his ministry. To people who were checking him out for the first time, he made that promise in Matthew 6, that if you seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, that he will give you everything you need. And you need to live as if that's true. Maybe you feel like you're wandering in the wilderness right now and you need to believe the promise of Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. You need to keep trusting him. Friends, I'll tell you, I am banking my entire one brief human life fully on the conviction that God keeps every one of his promises. Even though the world may think that we are crazy for living this way, I believe this is the most exhilarating way to live. We live daily on the assumption that God is faithful. God never forgets, never fails to keep his promises to us. That's where the abundant life is, found by believing and living that way. And in my 26 years of serving Jesus, I've never seen God fail to keep a single promise. He hasn't for me and he won't for you either. The third great truth we see about God here is that God accomplishes 
full salvation. In verses 6 through 8, God gives Moses a message to deliver to the Israelite people. And the structure here is pretty interesting. Notice that the message starts and ends with the statements, I am the Lord. He says he's going to make himself known who he is as the Lord Yahweh. And then he says seven times, seven different statements, I will do this or that. Just listen to this. Verse six, he says, Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord, I am Yahweh. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God. You shall know that I am the Lord your God, who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will bring you into the land that I swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and Jacob. I will give it to you for a possession I am Yahweh, I am the Lord. Here we see the God of Israel tends to show himself strong in these dramatic ways. But what caught my attention the most was the first actions named in each of these three verses. Verse 6, he says, I will bring you out of the land of Egypt. Verse 7, I will take you to be my people. Verse 8, I will bring you into this new land. I thought, man, what a perfect picture of the salvation that God accomplishes for his people. He didn't say, I'm going to bring you out of the land of Egypt and then dump you in the wilderness and you can see how you can scramble to make a new life for yourself there. No, that's not it at all. He said, I'm going to bring you out of slavery in Egypt. I'm going to establish myself to you as your God, your king, your provider, your ruler, the lover of his people. And then I'm going to bring you into a place that is dripping with milk and honey, the promised land, the lush land, the good land. You know, when we accept Jesus as our Savior and Lord, God doesn't just forgive us of our sin and then leave us to try to scurry and make a life as best we can. He saves us from our sin into a wonderful new restored relationship with him and for a new life filled with holiness, meaning, service, camaraderie, and eternity. The application for us here is to go after the full salvation that God offers. John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, once wrote a charge to all of the Methodist preachers. He said, you have nothing to do but save souls. Therefore, spend and be spent in that work. But he just didn't want them to be saved, people to be saved initially by getting forgiveness. He wanted them to be saved all the way. This is something the early Methodists pushed for called entire sanctification. That is, you get to the place where by the power of God, you aren't living a life of sin any longer. He forgives you, but then he fills you with the Holy Spirit so that you can root out the remnant of sin in your life. You can rid yourself of all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, slander, fear that resides in your soul. You can say no to that and mobilize it and then really live that life of loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and loving your neighbor as yourself. See, we Methodists, we don't believe that Jesus is the kind of leader who commands us to do something that we could never do with his help. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. He doesn't expect for us to live in defeat, never fully loving God with all of our heart, failing over and over again. He came to set us free. And so Methodists, we believe that we should always push for the entire sanctification of our hearts and our lives to him. He gives us the power to say no to sin and say yes to this new life. The final great truth we see about God in our text is that God pushes through human discouragement. In verse 9, Moses goes to deliver the message to the people of God. It says, Moses spoke thus to the people of Israel, but they did not listen to Moses because of their broken spirit and harsh slavery. 
So the Lord said to Moses, go in, tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let the people of Israel go out of his land. But Moses said to the Lord, behold, the people of Israel have not listened to me. How then shall Pharaoh listen to me? For I am an, a man of uncircumcised lips. But the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron and gave them a charge about the people of Israel, about Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to bring the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt. Here we see the people so discouraged that they can't even receive God's great pep talk to them. We see Moses so discouraged that he's going back to his previous excuses for why he shouldn't go and talk to Pharaoh at all. But God just takes the reins and charges them to keep moving forward. The application for us is to charge through discouragement and doubt. Whether we're seeking to follow God's plan for our lives or not, we will all go through seasons of discouragement. If we are seeking to follow God, our discouragement might be coupled with doubt. Because if we follow Jesus, that will always put us at odds with the values of the world around us. And when we get pushed back from following Jesus, not only do we feel discouraged, but we might doubt whether we really made the right decision to begin with. That's where Moses was. But I love the words of verse 13. But the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron and gave them a charge. I feel like sometimes the Lord just says to us, I hear what you're saying. I know you're discouraged. You've been listening to the lies of the enemy. You're feeling sorry for yourself. But I'm God and you're not. Get back in the game. Do what I'm telling you to do. Obey my word. And now you will see what I will do. Whatever you're going through today, I pray that this scripture is convicting and encouraging to you. Trust God's sovereignty. God is completely sovereign. He is infinite in wisdom. He is perfect in love. He will fulfill his plan for you if you keep following him. Live by God's promises. Base your actions every day on the promises of God, not circumstances or fears that you might have. Go after full salvation. Don't be content to let sin have some parts of your life in your heart and your mind. Keep pressing in until you feel the full power of the Holy Spirit and charge through discouragement and doubt. Don't follow your heart. Follow the Spirit. Don't obey your feelings. Obey God's Word, and He'll show you what He can do. Let's pray. God, I thank you that you're God and we're not. And sometimes we just need to listen to you. And we just need to tune out the lies of the enemy, tune out the voices of the naysayers and those who are uh, following the, the ways of the world and just set our eyes on Jesus. God, your promises are so strong and you lead us to a good life filled with a deep relationship with you and a life of freedom and joy. So Lord, I pray that we would live that way. And now we pray the prayer that you taught us as we say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now let us declare together what we believe. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, 
and the life everlasting. Amen.